What's our, what Rob? Yep, that's okay. Don't worry. We could edit the beginning part. I was just going to say, I like to know time frame. What what time frame do you 45 think? minutes. Well, okay, perfect. 45 minutes. So we'll, we'll be done by five o'clock. Okay. At the latest. Perfect. Cool. Yep. Okay. Well, my five o'clock, my time. Right. Yeah, that's my time too. Okay. Okay, great. Grid, what is going on today? I've got Dana Gentry with us. So excited to have Dana here. She's a, originally from Tennessee, but she grew up in Kentucky and now also spends her time in, between Kentucky and South Carolina. Dana, welcome to Grid Talk. Thank you for having me, Rob. I'm super excited to be here. Hey, it's my pleasure. Well, as you and I were getting to know each other a little bit uh, before we jumped on here, I uh, love the different income streams that you've created in your world. And what I want to do is expose our world, right, to those some of those different income streams, right? And normally yeah. what I like to uncover when we're talking to any guess when it comes to building wealth through real estate is understanding their journey in the beginning, understanding what that journey looks like, um, understanding the good, the bad, and the ugly of that journey, because people really learn through stories. And I love, yeah. I love sharing the entrepreneur story because it's not always sunshine and rainbows, right? Un unless your story has been all sunshine and rainbows. Has it? No, it 100% <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, let's let's unpack that a little bit, right? Tell me a little bit about your real estate entrepreneur journey. Yes. Okay. Gosh, where to start? I feel like Linda McKissick always says you were born and then what? And I never know what to where, where to start in the in the whole journey. Um, so believe it or not, I actually was attending the University of Kentucky for college and I had a job working for a property management company and a new construction builder. And in, in my state at the time, you didn't have to be licensed to sell new construction. So on the weekends, I would set open houses for this builder. And I would um, just collect the names of people who were coming in and pass them along. And I would help and talk to them and all those types of things. And so then while, while attending school. So this was, I guess, going into my junior year of college at UK. This has been many years ago. The, the builder came to me and said, hey, I think you should get your real estate license and actually talk to the people you're converting. You know, everybody that's coming in, we're, we're moving them over towards wanting to build. Have you thought about getting your license? I'm like, no, I've never thought about that ever. So I ended up getting my real estate license. I, I did it kind of in between taking classes in the summer and still working for the builder and um, and got licensed. And then within like a six month time period, sold 16 of the new construction houses. And mm -hmm. so I was making some pretty good money. So I actually dropped out of school. I, I don't have a college degree. I didn't graduate from college. Um, and I was selling real estate and I just never went back because I was busy, <laughs> very, mm -hmm. very busy. And, and got into selling. Um, and so from there, I just loved it. I loved connecting with people. I loved helping people. Um, I loved the sales side of it. I am a, like a teensy bit competitive. And so I liked I liked getting in and, and being able to know what other agents were doing and all those types of things. And um, started with a really small brokerage, then uh, went to Remax, loved my years at Remax, was super involved, um, had no complaints whatsoever. Um, until the end. And I, 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 I was, I did 10 million in a row, three years in a row, 10 million a year, three years in a row as an individual agent at a average sales price of 180,000. I mean, oh, so wow. I was doing a lot mm -hmm. of units um, mm -hmm. and had no life, had no quality of life whatsoever. And I was like, I'm going to get out of the business. I, there's no way that I can do this. And I was talking to other agents and it was like, they were, you know, uh, it's in senior citizen age to, I guess, say it, but say it nicely, still selling. And I always knew like that. I cannot do that. There's no way I can do this when I'm 80 mm -hmm. years old. And, and I had always heard, you know, when you pull up the last sign out of the ground, you're done and your money stops. And that scared me to be mm -hmm. honest. And I just mm -hmm. thought I am not going to be one of those people. And so knowing that I needed leverage and also knowing that I wanted to grow something where I was building something and being able to still get income. And at the time, I didn't know know what multiple streams of income were then. I didn't know passive versus active. I knew none of that stuff. I just knew that what I was doing wasn't sustainable. There was no way I was going to be able to keep doing it. And I tried to hire an admin here and admin there. And I didn't know how to hire people. And I 
was horrible at it, to be really honest. I would like somebody and then hire them and that never works out. Um, and so I remember I went to actually, one of my friends invited me to go hear Linda McKissick teach a class in Cincinnati, Ohio. So I took the day off. I drove to Cincinnati. I heard Linda teach and she was t talking about uh, how to get 10 listings a month forever. And, mm -hmm. you know, this has been nine years ago. And I just had so I took so many notes and I was like, man, I've nobody's ever taught me anything like this. And so I there were so many people that were there talking about teams. So I went back to um, a, a broker leader in my office and said, hey, I want to start a team. And she said, teams are a fad. And I was like, oh, <laughs> OK, <laughs> I'm like, OK, well. Um, okay. And so I remember long story short, I then I ended up moving my license to Keller Williams and I grew a team and I followed the millionaire real estate agent. And that year I brought on a full-time admin. I brought on a showing specialist who was moving into a buyer's agent. I had, I had never surpassed that 10 million mark in that year. We did 18 and a half million and just in that first year. And so I was like, okay, this works. So from the mm -hmm. beginning, I've been very bought into models. I still knew that I didn't want that to be my only source of income. Mm -hmm. um, I was making great money though. I mean, it, you know, it was great money and, and I was young and it was awesome and all of those things. Um, and so I just, I, I have a quote that I love, which is bloom where you are planted. And I've loved that for so long because mm -hmm. so many people say, how do you get opportunity? How have you gotten to do this? How have you gotten to do that? And I always say bloom where you're planted. You have to show up and be great mm -hmm. and do the work and care about people. And I did that my first year in Keller Williams and it paid off. And I got asked to be an investor in a new Keller Williams office that was launching in my city. Um, mm -hmm. And so they came and said, you have great energy and you you have great influence with people and you've always done the right thing and, and people love to work with you. We'd love for you to be an investor. And that actually started my second stream of income. Um, I bought into about 5% into a Keller Williams office uh, mm -hmm. for 30 grand and and made my money back in the first year and a half and and saw what it was like to have a check come in every month that I didn't really do anything for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, and, this, is per this is perfect, Dana, because you like I we you know, one of the things that I, I'm launching and that I'm passionate about is this concept called the income flip, right? It's where you're taking that that active income and converting it into passive income. And and this is going to be part of the our, the income flip channel, right? That's speaking directly to that yeah. agent um, avatar who, you know, is working their butt off and they're trying to figure yeah. out, hey, am I going to do this for the next 30 years or is there a better way to do it, Right. So what you're describing is, is a system, is a model, right? Create money, active income from this agent business. And then you saw, because you showed up, you saw opportunity to be able to invest yeah. in a market center, right? Or it could have been any business, but market center made a lot of sense because it, it you know, something you understood at that point. So what someone understood, you probably didn't know all the intricacies right in the beginning, right? Yeah. Well, it's funny though, Rob, because the one thing that I always remember, and I don't know who taught me this, was um, do and invest in what you know and what mm -hmm. you're good at. So for instance, I have never really put my money into the stock market because I don't know the stock market. I don't know anything about it. I've never learned it. I'm, I'm not, it doesn't, I, I know real estate and I know mm -hmm. people and leadership. And so for me, being able to look at what I know and figure out how I can go get these other streams of income and create active versus passive, um, and some of mine are still very active <laughs> and sure, some of, of them course. are are very passive, which is great. Um, but but I really wanted to invest in and figure out how to do that and what I already knew because it's quicker and it's easier and it, you're already you're confident about it. You know, you already know what it is. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why so many agents, I love it that they invest in. We have the opportunity. We have the greatest opportunity because we know when people are going to list their house before anybody else does, whether do we want to buy that house? You know, it, I think it's so great when agents invest in what they know. And Linda and Jim have been a big part of teaching me that, but because it's, it's comes natural. You're already in it every day. You're in it every day. What, what do you think stops people? I'm just curious from, from doing that, right? They, 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 yeah. I, I always wonder, right. It's like, they've been in the business 10 plus years and the thought hasn't really crossed their mind. Maybe they just haven't read them, met the right person to, to plant yeah. the seed in their mind. But I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are around that. I think it's a couple of things. I think one, I always say real estate is a different beast. 
It is the only business, it's got to be, that you can wake up in the mornings and at that you can be at the height of heights and you can have one phone call and you're in the pits of hell in like 30 <laughs> seconds. And then you get another one and you're like back up and then you're back down. And so I think it is an, um, it can be a very emotional um, mm -hmm. roller coaster type of business. And I think agents get so, and I'm guilty of this. I, I did this for 10 years of working um, in the business that we don't necessarily take time to work on the business and yeah. or on our plans. We are so caught up in the day to day and the inspection and the appraisal and the closing and the, the grind of it all that we don't. And, and it's great money. And so mm -hmm. when you're making great money from it and, and then you're, you're caught up in the hustle bustle in the everyday, for me, at least personally, I never really took the time. I, I wasn't intentional with my time to say, okay, I've got to work on my business and on my future and figure out what is my freedom number and what can I do to get some passive income? And sometimes you, and I, I teach a class about the five leadership lessons that I've learned from climbing the Keller Williams opportunity map. Because I've pretty much gone every step up, up it really without I was halfway through and didn't even know it existed. I never even saw it. <laughs> um, uh, but I teach a class on that. And one of the things that I talk about in there is sometimes you have to be willing to take a step backwards to go way, way, way forwards. And I took like a two hundred thousand uh, dollar backwards income year when I stepped out of selling and went into a leadership role inside of Keller Williams. Thankfully, I was blessed. And I at the time I could do that. It was OK. Um Yet, if I wouldn't have, it was, un and it was uncomfortable. I mean, it's sure. always uncomfortable to walk away from what you're used to. Um, yet, if I wouldn't have done that, and if I wouldn't have really taken that leap and taken time to say, okay, I know that I've got to work on my business and I've got to work on my streams of income and I've got to work on what really makes me happy. And to be totally honest, after 10 years of really hustling, I was kind of burnt out on the mm -hmm. buyers and sellers every single day. Mm -hmm. And it was the only thing I knew. I mean, I, I didn't know anything else other than real estate. And a lot of realtors, that's them. All they know is real estate. It's all they've done. Mm -hmm. And so I think it can be scary to think about, okay, I'm going to, I may have to go backwards for a minute, um, but I've got to focus on not just constantly this in the business every five minutes thing and really work on a plan. I wish I would have done it so much sooner than what I did. Sure. And what I remember one time- what what was your big Go epiphany that did, did you have? Like, what was there? Was there a day where you were like, okay, this something's got to change. Uh, was there something or was just this gradual? Like mine was kind of gradual. I mean, I can remember when I was offered, well, it's a funny story. We launched that new office that I was a, uh, an investor and a 5% investor. And we didn't have a, right after we launched within about four to five months, our team leader and our OP both resigned. So we were like the, the, the talk of the town, we had great momentum and we didn't have any leadership. And I always say, never say that you're just helping if you don't really want to do something. So I said, you know, Hey, I'll help. And I'll, I can help as the team leader for a minute until we get somebody or whatever. And, and then it ended up, turning into that was my new role. Um, and so I, I never, I never had like an actual moment, I think, but I do know that I, I can tell when I'm getting burnt out. And I think a lot of us can, and we ignore it. And I knew that I, I knew that what I was doing didn't fulfill me a hundred percent. Um, and so for me, I think just being in tune with truly how I was feeling and knowing that I did, I, I wasn't going to feel like that forever. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and really saying, okay, I've got to come, I've got to, I've got to focus on making some plans of what that is. I mean, I went from one income stream to 10 income streams in a four year period. And okay, it was, well, let, let's, okay, well, let's unpack. Whoa, let's unpack that. Right. So I know, I know of two agent income stream. You still have your team, right? Yeah. And I it was still, yes, o I still have my team. OP, OP well, first it was, first it was, so it, it was, it, it's my team. And then first it was my profit share. Um, mm. So when I came over to Keller Williams, I had great relationships with other agents at other companies. They called me and said, why'd you move? And, you know, I never looked at it. Now people would say recruiting. I never looked at it as I wasn't doing that. I just genuinely wanted to help the people that I was in relationship with and who I was friends with in the industry. I had, I always say this as agents, your relationships with other people really matter. I mean, with other brokers and especially now more than ever, oh my gosh, Rob, I just had a panel in Columbus last week talking about multiple offers and oh, people yeah. were saying people, other agents are, are, I know, I know. Yeah. I mean, relationships matter more now than ever, right? Your word, your, what you've done ever. over the last decade matters so much. Uh, it's crazy. 
Sorry, I cut you off. I was getting excited. I knew where you were going, where you were going with that. It's okay. No problem. I thought, I think I froze for a second. Um, relationships matter more than ever, a hundred percent. And so profit share to me was one of those, was my second stream because I was helping people come over to Keller Williams and we were, you know, helping them get their business better and, and all of those things. Um, and so it was great to be able to, to build my profit share. So that was second. My third was the market center investor when I bought in the 5%. So that then became a third stream of income for me. So my team was active and profit share and the market center um, ownership were both passive. Mm -hmm. From there, I did. I was a team leader for three years. Um, and so I had a I had a salary that was that was a stream that was coming in. And then I got to be an OP. So mm -hmm. when you're an OP, you have ownership and you have the salary, too. So that's kind of double dipping in your streams. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, gosh, what else? So now I have. Um, three offices, so three different streams from there. Um, so I've done some flip. I have a, I have a um, flip Airbnb hold LLC. So I, I do invest in real estate in that way as well. Um, I have the last year, not as much probably because we've been super busy with the offices, uh, oh. but I do love to do that. And then I also have as I do coaching and teaching and speaking and all of that stuff. So they've they've just grown uh, by the opportunities. And, you know, I think sometimes people think, too, that there it, everything has to be perfect for you to have an opportunity to line up to go take that opportunity. And one of my very favorite quotes ever, I think, is an Abraham Lincoln quote um, in the middle of difficulties lies opportunities. So when mm -hmm. things are when there are challenges happening or maybe there's something that in, there's challenges in the industry or in the market or there's challenges in maybe an office that you're a part of or a team or anything like that, that's where an opportunity is. And mm -hmm. every time we've ever had a shift in our market, there have been agents and teams and, and great entrepreneurs that have quickly risen to the top afterwards because in the middle of that difficulty or that shift, they've seen the opportunity and they've gone and made it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you're walking through different streams of income, you know, sometimes you got to look and say, OK, where is there a difficulty that I could make an opportunity out of that? I couldn't be an OP in the office that I was a team leader and my OP wasn't willing to step away. But I knew that I wanted to do that. So I went and started growing another area about 30 minutes outside of where our market center was. And when I got enough agents, I was able to to, to go to the region and say, hey, I want to create I've created this opportunity. I, I want the opportunity. What do I have to do to get to be the OP of that office? And so I think sometimes you just have to really think about that. When you're in the daily grind and talking about flipping your income, you sometimes do have to take a couple steps back and and step rise above some of that day to day and say, OK, I've got I'm going to play my future. And here's yeah. the things that I really want to do. Here's how I want to do that. And what does that look like for me? How much how much active income versus passive income do I have now? And then baby step it, you know, throughout the process. Yeah, for sure. I'm just curious because you've touched you've touched so many different areas in the business. What brings you joy, right? Which one brings you the most joy? I'm just oh, good question. Just out of curiosity. Um, you know, John Maxwell is a mentor of mine, and one of the things that I've learned from John is I know that my unique ability and and the reason God put me on earth is because I want to wake up every day and add value to other people. Mm -hmm. And if I can add value to other people, I feel fulfilled myself. Um, and so for me, probably the just being able to lead other people and help them, whether it's agents in our office or whether it's other agents that are at other companies that are struggling and I can help them with a business plan or whether it's creating opportunity for the people in my world. I just want to wake up and add value to everybody and be able to make their lives bigger. And I mm -hmm. think when you've had really good role models and mentors in your life that you've watched be able to do that and they've helped you do that, it's made it a little bit easier. You know, I look at John Maxwell and even Linda, Linda's huge. Not only is she one of my closest friends, but she's just been such a great mentor to me. Mm -hmm. I know you had her on your podcast, but um, I, she wakes up and she wants to add value to people's lives and people that are in their worlds, their lives get bigger. And mm -hmm. I want that. I want the people in my world to feel the same way. I just want to make sure that I wake up and add value to people every day. Um, I love the flips and the Airbnb. I love doing all that stuff. I love the the strategy around making our offices number one and getting that. I love mm -hmm. all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, if I'm not helping someone grow to their level of success or their definition of success, then I'm not as fulfilled. So I don't know if that really answers, but sure. It's people, people, people drive you, it's right? People. You know, um, how did you 
get connected with Linda to do, cause you, you guys run an awesome podcast, everything real estate, right? Like how, how did that come about? So it's a really a long story. Um, I mean, obviously I was an agent in Linda's region and then I worked my way up through leadership. So I got to know Linda that way. Um, and then one day, Lin I had been dabbling and wanting to start a podcast. Linda had been saying she wanted to start a podcast. One day we went to an office in Indiana that actually now I'm the OP of, ironically enough, it's so crazy. But five years ago, we went to this office. They were having a grand opening party and we went and one of their top agents, their top agent in that office, his name is Todd Paxton. Um, he said he was running this little YouTube, I think it was kind of video series. And he said, hey, could I interview you and Linda? And I, we were like, man, we, we don't have enough time like to do it separately. Could we just do it together? And he was like, yeah, that'd be even better. Will you guys just come down in the conference room after the party and let me just interview you guys real quick. We'll keep it quick, 15 minutes. And Linda and I were like, sure, we'd love to. And so we sat down and we did that interview and we actually still have someone took our picture with Todd when we were in the middle of the interview. And we I still have that picture saved because for when we got done with that, we looked at it, we were like, man, we love talking to each other. And like we flowed so well. So then I think Linda probably a week later reached out to me and she said, hey, I've been wanting to do a podcast. And I said, I've been wanting to do a podcast. And she said, the number one thing holding me back is I don't want to just listen to myself talk. I think it would be much better if we if I had a partner. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's I said, totally. I agree. And, she, and we I said, we flowed so well when we did that little interview for Todd. So that's we started the podcast and we that's just awesome. did it because. Yeah, we we like to talk to each other and we don't make the time to do it enough. So that's one of the reasons. And then the second reason is we wanted to bring value to anybody in the real estate industry. And just I mean, we don't make we don't sponsor, you know, we don't really do it. We don't gain anything monetarily from the podcast, but we love the interaction that we have with other people in the real estate industry. And for us, it's been one of the best ways to build relationships. Um, and it and we just love it. We enjoy it. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's awesome. I, I was, I was, um, before we jumped on, I was watching some of the interaction between the two of you and there is, there's yeah. a ton of chemistry. So it's great chemistry, right? I was like, that, it's, that, awesome. it, it's a lot of fun. I could tell you guys yeah. are having fun. Well, we do. We love each other. We have a lot of fun and we both bring different aspects. I mean, yes. Linda has just a huge track record of so many millions of things um, that she does that are so amazing. And I have another different perspective of things and we learn from each other and, it's it's just yeah it works it's been it's really great. Well, let me ask you, Dana. One, one of the one of the questions, and normally comes out um, as you've been on this journey and venturing in this you know realm of the the real estate entrepreneur. Um, I'm sure you've had your fair share of setbacks or challenges yeah. or holy shoot moments, right? Like. Right. Which I would suspect maybe has happened in your life. I'm just curious if you're willing to share, is there, is there any moment or a series of time that where that occurred? And then, and then how did you, how did you get past it? Yeah, there's been a lot. Um, honestly, yeah. I mean, I can think of so many different things and I, I never knew people used to always say, Oh, fail your way forward, fail your way forward. And I was like, Oh, that sucks. That sounds terrible. You know, who wants to fail? <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. reality is when you when you are in business or when you're an entrepreneur and especially when you're leading other people, you're going to fail. I mean, I, I fail every day at, at something or another um, and truly you learn from it. And so now I really do feel like the times that I've had setbacks, I can think of many times I've had setbacks, particularly in the leadership role. Um, I remember one year as a team leader. I was the number one recruiter in our region. We grew our office from. 62 agents to 224 agents in like less than two years. Uh, I attracted so many amazing agents and teams and it was just, it was, a, it was wonderful. Um, and then we had one big blow up uh, of kind of a disaster that happened in that market center with between two people relationship wise. And I lost a $60 million producing team, a $35 million producing team. I mean, it was just like one right after the other. And they all um, went, they went and kind of opened their own thing. And I was happy for them. And it was devastating at the same time. Sure. And, and I just thought, oh my gosh, this is, this cannot be happening. I've worked so hard. You know, we've done all these right things. We've never done anything wrong. Cause I always say, you know, we're always gonna do the right thing. And it was a huge setback. And, and I think pushing through that one, I had to, well, actually a couple of things. The best one, Rob, is John Maxwell has taught me one of the, 
best things ever. Um, and what and what John says is you have to have these things called nourishment centers. And nourishment centers are things that when you are feeling deflated or you're having a bad day or you have a big setback or, or you just have a or just something bad happens and you're in a bad mood, um, you have these nourishment centers and they're the things that you go to. So they may be I have a photo album on my phone of some favorites uh, mm. that I love of pictures. And I'll go back through and look. I have for me, I'm a person of faith. So I have scripture on there. It may be songs. It, I have a list of people that I can call. Linda's one of them. My best friend, Josh, is one of them where I know that they're going to be honest, but they're also going to just get me in a better headspace. It may be certain books that I need to revisit. Um, there's all kinds of things. And so I think one, it's really important for I had never heard of that before, the nourishment center. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really mm -hmm. important for people to know when you do have those things, what can you do quickly just to get your mindset? I am I host a Wednesday morning mindset every Wednesday at 9 a.m. I have a group of about over 2,000 people that are in it. And I just get on and do a mindset lesson for 30 minutes on Facebook and on Zoom. And I do that because I need it too. I want to bring value mm -hmm. to them, but I need mindset. I need mm -hmm. everybody needs to work on their mindset every day. And failures are a part of that. I think to that particular example, pushing through, I just had to rise above it and figure out, okay, instead of pointing fingers and saying, well, they left and they did this or they're doing that. I had to point thumbs and say, okay, what can I do differently? What could I have done differently? What could my team have done differently? And, and where can we learn and grow from this setback? And, and we learned a lot um, and and we grew a lot even after that. And we we changed some things. I mean, there's just, you always take that back and have a reflection period and say, okay, yeah, this, we failed or this sucked or we had a setback or whatever it is, but what could we have done differently and how can we push through it? And I think all, another piece of that, Rob, is I have to have really great people around me. I'm an energy feeler. Mm -hmm. And when I have people around me that are sucking my energy, it's not good for me. Mm -hmm. And so I think pushing through those, I've always had really, really great people around me. I mean, the the team that I work with and my general manager and director and all of them are just they're great people. And so sometimes they they can even pull me out of stuff when we have a setback yeah. and I'm like, oh, I'm done for the week. Forget it. I'm I'm going to Florida and we're not doing anything for a week. <laughs> they're like, no, wait a minute. We've got to do this, you know. Mm -hmm. But it happens. I mean, it's it's you're we're going to have growing pains. I just did a call this week with a team that I love. Oh, my gosh, I love them so much. They've had huge success over the last three years. I mean, their business has I'm talking team like 60 million dollar producing team. They've doubled their business and they're having a. they've had three agents leave their team and they are so distraught. And I'm like, guys, it's growing pains. I mean, you're you're going to have it. Everybody does, no matter what business you're in. You're going to have it. you got to figure out, one, don't stay in your rut. Get out of it. And two, just push through. Learn from it. What did you learn? What can you learn from it? And then go and figure out how to get back on and ride the bike again. A great book, if you haven't read it, is Ray Dalio's book, Principles, right? Love it. Yeah. 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 And he talks about that loop, right? That just happens. Okay. It's it just, it just that that you're constantly hitting new ceilings. New ceilings yep. are new challenges, right? Yep. New challenges going to mean that you're going to you're going to you're going to fail and you're going to you're going to fall yep. down and then you pick yourself back up and you loop back up even higher. I love that because that that personally gave me permission to understand that that's just a natural cycle of all of our growth, right? It just Yep, it totally is true. Yeah. yeah. And you know one other thing, I don't know if Linda talked about the four C's when you had her on your podcast, oh, yeah. but it is mm -hmm. okay. For me, that fifth C of complacency. So the four C's is people, anybody that's going to be successful, you have to usually go make one big, big ginormous commitment. Linda would say it needs to be so big that it makes you want to wet your pants, but you go mm -hmm. ahead and do it with wet pants because you know that you're going to, you're going to make the commitment. And then after that, you get the courage. And then after the courage, you get the credentials or the capabilities. And then after that, you get the confidence. We think as humans that we have to like, we've got to muster up the courage first and we have to have the credentials first and we've got to be confident and then we can go make the commitment. The reality is that a lot of times it doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I love the fifth. You have to go make the big commitment first, but I love the fifth C is complacency. And if you aren't finding yourself making another big commitment and another big commitment, then you're going to get stuck in that complacency spot. Sometimes when we have setbacks or failures, at least for myself, I can tend to get stuck in that complacency and I think mm -hmm. for me, a lot of times to pull out of it, I got to go make another big commitment because it's mm -hmm. going to get me out of it. It's going to get me onto something else. And then I'm going to get the courage and the credentials and all those things. But I'm, it's not going to happen if I don't first go make the big commitment. So I kind of have tried to live by that. I can tell 
when I'm when I've had a setback or a failure and it's gotten me in a rut, instantly I'm like, nope, I got to go make another big commitment because I'm not going to live in this space. Yeah, it's interesting because you're I, I could tell just from the pattern of your trajectory, right? You're running a team, then you're going to go be a team leader. You're going to be an operating principal, and yeah. right, you you've just kept you just kept pushing the envelope, right? And uh, but all of it, like you said, it's people are at the center of all of that, right? Leadership yeah. is at the center of that. So let's talk a little bit about leadership. I mean, what obviously John Maxwell says leadership is influence, nothing influence. more, nothing less, right? Yep. Um, but what 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 would be some one, two, three leadership pieces of advice that you've learned along the way that that might be good for that real estate entrepreneur that's that's looking to get to the next level in their career and and realizing it, well, actually sometimes they don't realize that their growth will come through people and relationships, right? They think that maybe it's their physical energy and will, but that we they'll they'll soon learn that that's not the case, right? Your physical energy, your own will can only go so far and you can't duplicate yourself. So yeah. what advice would you give that aspiring real estate entrepreneur on leadership? I would say um, it, it is all about influence and nothing more, nothing less. I think we already talked about relationships. One of the biggest things I say is it's about the relationships. I mean, when you are a leader, you are held to a higher standard. You're held to a different standard. People look at you differently. Um, it's it's all about the relationships and you have to be committed every single day to bettering other people's lives. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of the hardest things about being a leader is sometimes I wanted it more for them than they actually wanted it for themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and so you kind of have to, you have to have that line between where, okay, I may want it more for them and can I help them get there? But what is it that they really want? I, I've had the same coach for almost six years now. One of my coaches, and I love her so much because she coaches every single week mm -hmm. when we get on our call, she says, What's the single most important thing I can help you with today? Mm -hmm. She coaches to me and as and what's happening in my life right at that minute. And what what do I need the help with? And as a leader, um, you have to do that with the people that are around you. I mean, I really mm -hmm. feel like it's it's about them. And sometimes you may want it more for them than they want it for themselves. Um, but it's about having them be able to self-discover. And I think leadership for me has been, oh my, I mean, I'm still learning. Oh my gosh. Every mm -hmm. single day I had never, I always say when I took the team leader role, I had never led anybody but myself ever. I mean, I had mm -hmm. no leadership experience. Um, and I am a leadership junkie. I mean, I soak it up. I love it. I read every book. And I mean, I just literally have stacks of books right here today <laughs> that I, that I just finished. So I'm going to mail and share them to share them with somebody else. But I think you, as a leader, you have to constantly be willing to grow. That's one of the yeah. things that I've learned from John Maxwell it's hard. It, one of the hardest things about being a leader is leading yourself. And it's because sure. we want to get wrapped up in everything else. But if you aren't leading yourself, then you're not going to be a great leader to your people. And so I feel like you have to be learning based. You have to be growth oriented. You have to have that growth mindset so that you can continue to do other things. Um, I think another thing as a leader is you have to have the vision. Leaders have to be visionary. They have mm -hmm. to be able to say, hey, Here's well, Jack Welch has a great YouTube video. I love it. I've, I've shown it in meetings for years. And he says, great leaders, they tell people where they're going. They tell people why they're going there. And then they tell them what's in it for them. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's all about the vision. When you're going to be a leader and you're really going to pursue that leadership path, you have to be able to have some sort of visioneering skills to say, OK, here's the vision. Let me paint that picture for you. Here's where we're going. Here's why we're going there. And here's what's in it for you, no matter if you're leading a buyer's agent on your team or a whole office full of a thousand agents. I mean, it's the same thing. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's the same thing. It's so funny. You should say that because I remember um, when I, you know, I served on the ALC for years and years and years and, and, uh, yeah. and our team leader, amazing Mike coffee. He's not our team leader anymore, but uh, Mike, you know, would say we're going to be number one. You know, and and I would say, okay, Mike, but what does that mean for me, right? I would always <laughs> say, what does that mean for me? And then we would have, yeah. and then we'd reverse engineer it, right? Like I always just spoke my mind, right? Um, and and then and then I was like, okay, yep, I buy into it now, I get it, right? But I needed to connect the dots of how yeah. the the office being number one was going to help yeah. us build our organization, our team. So 
Yeah, I think, yeah. yes, definitely. Agents need help connecting the dots for sure. Most of the time, anybody does, not just agents, anybody does, but a sure. great leader will paint a great vision. And the last thing I would say about leadership is, um, I'm trying to think, I don't know if it was Gary. Somebody said to me one time, we were talking about talent. I think it might've been Gary Keller. And he said, always remember, you're not gonna attract what you aren't. Yep. You have to be what you want to attract. Mm -hmm. And so for mm -hmm. me as a leader, I, I have, there's certain people that I want to lead and attract. So I know I have to be that person every single day. If I want to attract people with great energy, I got to show up with great energy every day. Mm -hmm. If I want to mm -hmm. attract people who always do the right thing, I have to always do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you have to, you have to be what you want to attract and who you want to be in business with. And sometimes some days it's easier than others. Um, you know, I love, I'm a huge follower of Craig Rochelle. He's actually a pastor, but he has a leadership podcast and he just, he teaches leadership and he's amazing. And he always says, people would rather follow a leader that's real than a leader that's right. Mm -hmm. And I've always mm -hmm. resonated with that so much because for me, I would rather do that. I don't care if a leader's right all the time. I want to know that they're real and they're authentic and they're genuine. Mm -hmm. They have a vision. Mm -hmm. They're going to be able to take me somewhere. Um, I'm going to benefit from them. And so I think we have to think about those things. I love one of the things that um, Linda has always said this. Um, none of us are good enough to make any buyer buy, any seller sell, uh, any agent move to Keller Williams or any of that stuff, people are only going to do what they self-discover and mm -hmm. they self-discover through three ways, great questions, stories, mm -hmm. and experiences. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think as a leader, you have to, you have, you have to master being able to be a great question asker, even mm -hmm. as a great realtor, you have to learn how to ask really great questions. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a story. I, I'll never forget this. I'm assuming, you know, Diana Kokoska. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we went to a John Maxwell event um, it was actually the first one I had ever gone to, I think, which was in Beverly Hills, California. This was several years ago. And it was a um, it was a private John Maxwell event. And I was so pumped. I'd been a huge fan of John Maxwell for many years. I'd never met him. Um, just always. He was my mentor through podcast and books mm -hmm. and all those things. Mm -hmm. And we showed and we went we sat down at the table and it was the opening session. And this is a small, small group, 100 people or less. And I'm at Di Di Diana's at my table and I see her open this book. She's actually sitting in two chairs over me and I see her open this little notebook, no bigger than, you know, a regular little size notebook. And I see her flip to and she's and she's frivolously flipping through these pages. And so I and I'm wondering what she's doing. And so I look over and I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, these are all the questions that I came up with to ask John if I get the opportunity to ask him a question. Mm -hmm. And she had pages, Rob. I'm talking like she probably had 12 or 13 pages of just... <laughs> hundred uh, uh, questions. I don't remember how many she had a ton of questions. And I remember sitting there and I was like looking around and I'm like, Oh, and I have nothing. <laughs> and, I'm, and I have none. <laughs> and I have no questions. So then I'm like, Oh God, I hope he doesn't call on me. And I don't get to be the one asking. So then I'm like, Oh my God, I've got to think of some questions really fast to ask. And so I'm like looking over at Diana, but it taught me the biggest lesson because honestly, I, and I've been to many events with Diana, many John Maxwell events since then. And no matter what it is or who it is, we sh she shows up and she's got pages of questions and she takes time and she prepares them. And so now I do the same thing. They're probably not near as good as her questions, but I, I do. I prepare the question because if you get the opportunity to be around a great leader, gosh, how horrible would that be if you didn't have some great questions prepared to ask them? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, Right when I started my career in, you know, sales, um, I remember the sales. He was, he was a recruiter. I was a recruiter. I, I started off as an executive recruiter. That was my. That's what I did pretty much. Right, and um, he said, "Your life will be determined by the questions that you ask." And I remember yeah. I was like, I was like, that's that's pretty profound, right? The questions you ask will determine, you know, the quality of your life. And so then. He's like, you You have to start asking better questions, better questions of yourself, better questions of your clients, yeah. but it just better questions, right? And people will judge you by the type of questions that you ask, right? And I was like, oh, okay, I better get good at asking questions, so right? So true. Yeah. And get really curious about people, which is one of the things yeah. I love about this, right? Because I can get curious about, I was a psych major in college and I just always love to understand like why people do what they do. Right. And, yeah. and what, why, what, like how they determine their path. Right. So let me take a step back real fast. 
and uh, just ask you a couple last minute questions, right? So that we be 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 on track for the time that I promised you. Um, it's gone so fast. <laughs> it has. It goes fast, right? It goes fast when you're having fun. You know, one of the things that that is important to think about, especially for real estate entrepreneurs, is how to build these additional revenue streams, right, in their life, whether it's title or mortgage or property management or profit yeah. share. Um, you know, these are questions that they should be asking, right? If they're not asking, they're questions they should be asking. What advice would you give somebody as they start on this journey and they're contemplating setting up an additional income stream, right? Where would you advise somebody to start? The first thing I would say is, what do you love doing? What are you passionate about? Because that's going to come naturally and it's going to be easier for you. There is a form that um, I've learned through strategic coaching, Dan Sullivan. And um, I can't think of the name of the form crap, but I'll, impact, I'll have to send it to you. The impact, is uh, it, impact filter. Uh, well, that's one of them, but there's another one too. And the, the one that I'm thinking of, um, let me try to find it. The one that I'm thinking of, actually you list out, there's four different quadrants and you, mm. the top one is you list out all the things that you're doing that you love doing that give you energy and passion and you're really good at. The next one is I'm doing all of these things and I'm great at them. Like, like Rob would say, man, Dana is so great at blank. Mm. And they, it doesn't fill me up. It does. I'm not mm. passionate about it. I might be great at mm. it, but I'm not passionate about it. So I would say, ask yourself, what do you love that you're passionate about? And then how could you turn that into another stream of income? So if it's mm. somebody who's an agent and they love the staging and they love getting houses ready and they love being able to say, this countertop matches this hardwood and you should use this paint color and all that stuff, then going after and figuring out how to find some flips may be great for them because they're going to love, it's going to give them energy to, you know, take a house and put some lipstick on it or do some cosmetic things and then be able to turn around and make a profit from it. That mm -hmm. might be something great. It may be that they want to get it. They, they have an interest in property management. So holding on to things and building that long-term wealth building may be mm -hmm. great. It may be that they love their relationships with other agents and they have great relationships and they are in masterminds with agents at different brokerages. Then profit share might be something that they need to put a plan behind and really mm -hmm. make it another income stream. I think when you're going to start building these streams, you have to really think about what do you know and what are you passionate about? Because you're going to have the energy to want to do it more. If you just said, I want to go build this extra stream of income and I'm going to go and you know, do it by investing in the stock market. Well, that doesn't, that might be great. And for some people, actually, I just had a meeting today with a, one of my brokers in my offices and she was flipping through and she opened a notebook and she said, I write down my stocks every single day. And I said, really, you have stocks? And she said, yeah, I love it. And you would have mm -hmm. never, I mean, she, you would have never thought in a million years that she would be in the stock market. Never, ever. And I said, really, I didn't know that about you. And she said, I love it. I've always just had an interest in it. And she said, every day I look at them and every day I write them in my book and every day I look on my phone and she's, she loves it. She's passionate about it. Yeah. For me, that would drive me bonkers. So it's not, so I need to pay somebody else to do that for me because I don't necessarily enjoy it. So I, I think you have to advice. find something that you love, that you're passionate about. I love that. I love that. And you know, uh, that's the first time I've heard that put that way. Um, because sometimes people are like, Oh, I just want to go start an income stream and I'm going to do, uh, this recruiting income stream because everybody is doing it. Right. Um, everybody else you, is doing it. Yeah, that's right. Everybody else is doing it, So I need to do it. No, do, do what you love where you find energy. Right. Yeah. I, by the way, one of the things that I love about Dan Sullivan, I just discovered Dan, by the way, which is, weird because he's been around forever. I just discovered him. I read the book, Who Not How, and I was like, oh Who my is this gosh. Guy? Like this is like the best book I've read in the last decade, right? And yeah. um it's a profound book. So but one of the things he he talked about in there was procrastination is wisdom, right? Yes. And I was like, oh okay. I makes a lot of sense, right? Let's let's find somebody else who gets energy off of this thing that I've been like you know, wanting to do, but I just haven't done it. Right. Yep. Um, find the right who to do it. So that's one of my favorite books I've read ever. I send that book to everybody. All my teams have read it. It's yeah. the best. And I want to share with you, is it okay if I just, it might take me one minute to read something from the book that I think please, will help people. Please do. 
Okay, I don't know if you remember this from the book, but this was my favorite part of the book. And it was the 10 ways that Dan um, deems when he's successful. And I mm -hmm. feel like we always talk about, let's get all these streams and let's do all this because I just want to be successful. Well, mm -hmm. everybody's definition of success is different. What's successful mm -hmm. to you might be different to me, might be different to whoever. And so I love this. And here, here were the 10 ways. Number one, I can wake up every day and ask, what would I like to do today? Number mm -hmm. two, my passive revenue exceeds my lifestyle needs. Number three, I can live anywhere in the world that I choose, which COVID has made a little bit easier. Number four, I'm working on projects that excite me and they allow me to do my best work. Number five, I can disappear for several months with no drastic effect on my income. Number six, there are no whiny people in my life. That might be my favorite. Number seven, <laughs> number seven, I wear my watch for curiosity um, and I have no time obligations or deadlines. Number eight, no, I'm sorry, that was number eight. I have no time obligations or deadlines. Number nine, I wear whatever I want whenever I want. And number 10, I can quit at any time. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I wanted to share that might be a good note to end on, Rob, is because when you're looking at doing an income flip, and you're thinking about all your different streams of income, you can go do so many different things. But what is it that's going to make you have your definition of success? Mm -hmm. um, and how can those streams get you to your list? Maybe it's not those 10. It might be a different 10 or it might be a mixture of some of those or a, some, some of a couple of other ones. But whatever it is, it needs to be getting you closer to what your definition of success is, because most of us are all achievers. And we all say, we're never going to retire. Well, we want to wake up every day and we want to keep doing this. And we want to keep doing that. And at the end of the day, it's because we're an achiever. We want to achieve. We want to do, we want to do something. We want to be, we want to have that level of keep achieving every single day. Um, however, our definition of success might be different. And so when you're thinking about doing an income flip and having these different streams, what is it that you love that's going to get you closer to your definition of success? Boom. Boom. I love it. No, I love those of, 10 things. I mean, yeah, I have them in, written in every one of my books because I go to it constantly and think, okay, this is why I'm doing this. And when I have a failure or a setback, I go back to this and I'm like, wait a minute, this is why I'm going to keep going because I haven't reached my definition of success yet. Sure. Sure. And, and, and so it sounds like you just adopted his, his definition. It's a great definition, right? Like I, like I'm listening to that. I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, a big one of mine was to be able to operate out of two states because my family and my fiance are in South Carolina and my entire life and businesses are in Kentucky mm -hmm. and, and one's not switching to the other. So I had to really, I've worked really hard for the last three years to say, okay, one of my big definitions of success is I need to be able to operate out of two states. I need to be able to have the balance. Um, and thankfully really COVID did make that a little bit easier, but that yeah. was one of, that's one of my big ones. And so I think, which he said, work from where, wherever. So it kind of falls in line with, but there are certain things that we all know that we want to, that when we get those, we're going to feel successful. You know, it's going to, it's going to be, it's going to make our hearts warm because we have this great definition of, Hey, I've really strived and achieved. And now I've, I've gotten there. We might, then we might be on to the next thing, but still you you've gotten some sort of closer to your definition of success. Well, I'll, I'll end it with this. You know, what's so cool about that is and what's so cool about what we do is that we can create our own worlds, whatever that yeah. is for us. Right. Yeah. It really, we have the ability to create our own life, our own world. Yeah. This business allows us to be able to do it. Right. Yeah. And so, um, so Dana, thank you so much for sharing with, with us here at grid today. Like I know a lot of people are going to take a lot of amazing information from this and welcome to the grid family. You're now, you, you've now been immortalized into the grid family. We appreciate you. I love it. I'm super pumped. I love everything you're doing. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity and anything I can ever do to help. I will. Sounds great. We're going to make sure that we put all your contact information below and Instagram and all your, you know, all your social handles, all the things, all the things. Fair <laughs> enough. Thanks, Dana. Take care. Thank you so much. You too. Bye-bye. Sure.